the last chapter, we saw the creation of what would become the military-industrial complex, with the idea of it first coming from Wall Street speculator Bernard Baruch in 1915, who then went to President Wilson with the idea, which then came to life in December of 1916 with the first meeting of the Council of National Defense, of which Bernard Baruch was a member, then to the creation of the War Industries Board in 1917, of which Bernard Baruch was a member and then with the reorganization of the War Industries Board in March of 1918, with Bernard Baruch having absolute control over everything. And by the end of the war, Wall Street was trading in military goods all over the world. And of course the biggest suppliers of these war materials were names like DuPont, Morgan, and Rockefeller. In the years between World War I and World War II, would see these munition makers not only selling to the countries of both sides of whichever war was going on, but would even see their operatives admitting that their businesses would hold for war in order to quote, make a living, end quote. But we'll look into that in part two of this series. Right now, in the final chapter of part one, we're gonna have a look at how the Bush family rose to power right in the middle of everything we've seen so far in this series, to this point, with the rise of Samuel Prescott Bush, who was born in Orange, New Jersey in 1863, his father, James Smith Bush, was a lawyer and an Episcopal priest. So while not exactly poor, Samuel Bush certainly wasn't raised with the silver spoon of a DuPont or a Morgan, for example. And for the viewers who don't know who he is, of which I'm sure there's many, one of his sons was Prescott Sheldon Bush, who would be a senator for 12 years. And he was the father of U.S. Vice President and then President George H.W. Bush, who was the father of U.S. President George W. Bush, or W and also the father of 2016 U.S. presidential candidate John Ellis Bush, or Jeb. So that's quite an impressive lineup of direct generational descendants, isn't it? The very definition of a political dynasty. And the reason I say that dynasty all begins with Samuel P. Bush is because of a chance connection that happens in 1901, which changes the Bush family from your basically unknown, pretty average American family into what's probably become America's longest running and certainly most powerful political family dynasty that still to this day has a Bush in the game of politics, as the current Texas land commissioner is, wait for it, why George Bush of course, George Prescott Bush, Jeb's son. And I expect that he'll be president one day, naturally, because nothing would exemplify to the rest of the world just how totally honest and free the US electoral system actually is than to have a third president named George Bush. Now, having a look at Samuel Bush before he rose up into the world of the Wall Street Kings. He would graduate from the Stevens Institute of Technology in 1884 with a degree in mechanical engineering, and he also played on one of the first regular college football teams in the United States. And from there he would start working in the booming railroad industry, getting a job at the Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis Railroad Company and then he would go on to become the superintendent of the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad Company until May of 1901. And there's not really a whole lot about Samuel Bush in modern outlets, and that seems to be intentional, as we'll see. But looking around at some of the modern day outlets, we do learn some interesting things, such as in 1901, when he left the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad Company, he then became the general manager and vice president of Buckeye Steel Castings, and Buckeye Steel Castings was being run by Frank Rockefeller, who had become a shareholder way back in 1892. And Samuel Bush was vice president and general manager from 1901 to 1908, and then was president and general manager from 1908 until 1927, having taken over the position of president of Buckeye Steel in 1908 from Frank Rockefeller. So as we can see, it's in 1901 that would see a Bush Samuel P. Bush, entering into the world of the elites, namely the Rockefellers and by business association, the Harrimans, as we'll see. And nothing was given to him, so to speak. He did earn his way up the ranks, to be sure. And now let's have a look at a couple more modern day outlets and learn some more little tidbits about Samuel P. Bush. And the Business Insider has a pretty good piece on the four generations of Bushes, starting with Samuel Bush. And there we can see he was on the board of directors for the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And he helped found the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So how about that? 
and the Business Insider tells us that in World War I, Samuel Bush was the chief of the Ordnance Small Arms and Ammunition Division on the War Industries Board. So how about that? Another good outlet I found with some interesting information about Samuel Bush, believe it or not, comes from AcademicKids.com. And they tell us that Buckeye Steel made railway parts for the Harrimans, and that the two families were closely associated at least until the end of World War II. And we didn't look into the Harrimans yet, but if you'll remember, we saw E.H. Harriman way back near the beginning of the series as one of the then called robber barons. And he was pretty much the king of the railroads in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But he died in 1909, leaving everything he owned to his wife, Mary, who then became the richest woman in the United States. Two of his sons, W. Avril Harriman and E. Roland Harriman, who will look at more in part two of this series, but they would come into their own prominence in the 1920s, as would Samuel Bush's son, Prescott Bush. So while Samuel Bush and E.H. Harriman would be associated together with business ties until E.H. Harriman's death in 1909, Samuel's son, Prescott Bush, would be closely associated together with E.H. Harriman's sons, Avril and Roland Harriman, from the 1920s all the way through the Second World War, hence what we see written here. Then we can see about Samuel Bush becoming Chief of the Ordnance, Small Arms and Ammunition section of the War Industries Board and they mention Bernard Baruch and some of his ties, including E.H. Harriman. And if you'll remember, they both held seats on the New York Stock Exchange back in the early 1900s. So of course they were close associates. And below we see Remington dominance of ammunition and small arm contracts during World War I continue during Bush's government service and many years beyond. And of course it would continue under Bush. He was a Rockefeller man since 1901 after all. And below that they talk about the Nye Committee, which we'll be looking into in part two of this series. And below that we see something I've read in multiple other outlets as well. Most of the records and correspondence of Samuel P. Bush's arms related work with the government were destroyed at the National Archives in order to save space. So really, Samuel Bush's World War I records were destroyed in order to save space? And if you go over to the National Archives and do a search for Samuel P. Bush, or Samuel Bush, or Sam Bush, or whatever, you'll not find a single document from the era, meaning around World War I, with his name on it. So that's rather interesting. And actually you won't find any documents about him at all. And now check this out. Samuel Bush died on February 8, 1948, and during my research into him, I discovered something I found to be simply incredible. Many of you might be wondering as to where I get so many old newspapers from that I use in my videos. And one excellent source is in Google's newspaper archive, where they have tens of thousands of newspapers going back a couple of hundred years. So I started to dive into February 8, 1948, the day Samuel Bush died, to see what I could find. And instead of finding anything about Samuel Bush, I was rather shocked to find this. From the Gettysburg Times, for example, for February 8th, 1948, there's no editions available. They have all the days before and after available, but they don't have the February 8th edition available. And, as I would discover, this was the case with newspaper after newspaper after newspaper after newspaper. What are the odds that all of these newspapers, all of them, would be missing only their February 8, 1948 editions, the day Samuel P. Bush died, yet they all have all of the editions available of the days before and after that one mysterious day? I mean, what are the chances of that? I don't think Samuel Bush's records were destroyed to quote, save space, end quote, 
but I do believe his records were indeed destroyed, and it would appear that certain newspapers were pulled too. Of the newspapers I did find for February 8, 1948, none of them mention Samuel Bush. And of the newspapers I went through for February 9, 1948, well over a hundred of them, I was only able to find a mere two pieces about Samuel Bush's death. And to note, viewers who subscribe to the New York Times might want to go there, as there's apparently an article in their archives from February 9, 1948, about Samuel Bush's death. I don't subscribe to them, so I'm not sure what's written. Something nice and complimentary, no doubt. But from the Milwaukee Sentinel on February 9, 1948, we see in the obituaries a write-up on Samuel P. Bush, and we learn a little bit more about him here. As they say, he headed the war chest in 1914 and joined the War Industries Board a year later, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But I find it rather interesting they say that the survivors include only his wife Martha, who was his second wife, and that's it. There's no mention of his children, including Prescott Bush, who's well prominent at this point, nor his grandchildren, which at this point would include a college-going George H.W. Bush. So I find that to be rather odd. And really, looking at his gravestone, it seems rather plain for a man of his stature and accomplishments, I notice as well. Now the second piece I found on Samuel Bush's death from February 9th, 1948, was a write-up about his death, and pretty much gives us the same information as we just saw in his obituary, telling us he headed the war chest in 1914, and a year later he joined the War Industries Board. But they also tell us that he had charge of the facilities and forging division, and that is something we'll be taking a good look at. But notice both pieces said that he joined the War Industries Board a year after he headed the war chest in 1914. But as we saw earlier, the War Industries Board wasn't created until 1917, and the mix-up is because of the ever-changing government bodies throughout the war. These newspapers would have been more correct to say that he joined the General Munitions Board in 1915, which eventually fell under the Council of National Defense, and then the War Industries Board in 1917. At any rate, I feel I was lucky to find these write-ups, as I have to admit that searching for any existing documentation about Samuel P. Bush, from the era of which he lived, proved to be the most challenging search of any of the people I've researched so far. Like I say, I do believe most of his records were destroyed, or buried away from public view. So let's have a look at the surviving documentation that I have managed to dig up and find out about Samuel P. Bush. And over the years, I've actually managed to dig up quite a bit. And this will probably be the biggest collection of Samuel P. Bush material assembled together that you'll find on the internet. So let's have a look. And the earliest thing I could find takes us back to 1901. In May of 1901. And this is when he resigned his position as superintendent of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railways as he headed to Columbus to become the vice president and general manager of Buckeye Steel. And as we've seen, Buckeye Steel is where he begins his relationship with Frank Rockefeller. And if you'll remember, we saw a connection with Frank Rockefeller and Bernard Baruch a year earlier. And soon we'll see the connections with Samuel Bush and Bernard Baruch which I believe evolved because of both of their connections to Frank Rockefeller. Anyways, the next thing I could find on Samuel Bush is at the beginning of 1906, where he registered a patent on a car coupling. And then at the end of 1906, we see him registering a patent on draft gear. Then in June of 1907, we see Samuel Bush again registering a patent on draft and buffing apparatus. And while not an article from the time period, here's a picture of Samuel Bush's mansion from 1908. That's quite the house, isn't it? And here it is in more modern times as part of a private or gated community called Prescott Place. Then we fast forward to August 18th, 1914, just two weeks after Britain declared war on Germany 
and Samuel Bush was in England at the time and apparently in a rush to get home, as we can see. Declaring that he embarked from Liverpool with several others as steerage passengers, Samuel P. Bush, millionaire, head of a local steel castings company, cabled to Governor Cox asking him to endeavor to arrange for disembarkation at a special pier instead of Ellis Island. The cablegram failed to give any details of the plight of the Americans. So, Samuel Bush already has enough pull to just send the cable to the governor, asking him to set something up so he doesn't have to disembark with the rest of the steerage passengers. And it's interesting that Samuel Bush and his group of others actually travel as steerage passengers. That's the lowest, quote, class, end quote, for traveling on ships back then. And that's why the paper mentions Samuel Bush as being a millionaire as well. But I suppose there was a rush by foreign visitors from all over the world to leave England when war was declared. And that's the best Samuel Bush and his group of others could book. Now we fast forward to August of 1916. And we see Samuel Bush as a member of the advisory committee of the Columbus State Civil Service Commission. And it says the Civil Service Commission, whose efficiency department has made a lot of radical recommendations for reorganization, that had been branded as unworkable by the members of the commission was not represented. The suggestion was made by Bush, who said his experience with the Industrial Commission had shown him it was a hard-working body, that work was done speedily, and that it did have a commendable degree of efficiency. And the suggestion made by Bush is at the top there, an experienced business organizer to be secured to study the Industrial Commission and make recommendations for improving the work. And we can see in this article a couple of traits of Samuel P. Bush. His attention to detail and efficiency, which comes from his studies at the Stevens Institute, and his leadership. And as we'll see, both of these traits will serve him well in the coming years. Next we see in January of 1917, Samuel Bush appears to be appealing a decision on a patent in court. Then in February of 1917, it would appear that Samuel Bush lost the appeal as Justice Van Orsdell affirmed the decision of the commissioner. Now, let's have a look at the Handbook of Economic Agencies of the War of 1917, where the United States is part in World War I, as this was released by the War Department in September of 1919. And this is one of the few surviving government documents from the time period that mentions the name Samuel P. Bush and his wartime activities. And it's a listing of all the various government bodies or agencies that operated during the war, and what they did, and who was in charge. And we can see that Samuel P. Bush was the chief of the Ordnance, Arms, and Ammunition Section, Finished Products Division of the War Industries Board. And this is what you'll see in modern day outlets that do talk a little bit about Samuel P. Bush. But he was also the chief of the Forgings, Guns, Small Arms, and Small Arms Ammunition Section, Finished Products Division of the War Industries Board as well. And, and this is most important, Samuel P. Bush was the director of the Facilities Division of the War Industries Board, which was formed at the end of August 1918. Simply put, creation of Facilities Division to speed up industry largely through the conversion of plants to war work was announced today by Chairman Baruch of the War Industries Board. Samuel P. Bush of Columbus, Ohio was head of the new division. It will be the study of the division to consider all questions of need and suggestions of need of industrial facilities for the conduct of the war. Mr. Bush will determine whether existing facilities can be adjusted to meet increased war requirements and, where necessary, will direct creation of new facilities. And we also learn what Samuel P. Bush was doing for over a year before he became the director of the facilities division. When his appointment as the director of the facilities division was posted in the official U.S. Bulletin, which is not like a newspaper as it was published by the government during the war by the Committee on Public Information, so unlike a newspaper, which we can consider as a historical document to be sure, 
but the editions of the U.S. official bulletin are actually government documents in the historical record. And in the announcement of Samuel P. Bush to the position of Director of the Facilities Division, we see he's been directing Ordnance Facilities expansion for more than a year, and has held an important place in the War Industries Board since its organization. But it's the year plus that he's been, quote, directing Ordnance Facilities expansion, end quote, that interests me. And he's obviously done a great job of it as he's now the head of the Facilities Division which means he'll be doing the same kind of directing and organizing and expansion for all of industry that he had just been previously doing for the Ordnance Department for over a year. And the timing of it couldn't have been better, as we'll see. And something else I noticed was back when this happened, Samuel Bush's appointment as Director of the Facilities Division was published in multiple newspapers, as it was a pretty big deal. Well, at the same time, I couldn't find any references to his appointments as chief of the two different small arms, ammunitions, ordnance, and forging sections. Perhaps they're not quite as important postings to warrant news articles, maybe. Meanwhile, in the modern outlets that do have some information on Samuel Bush, I notice mention only of his posting as chief of the ordnance, small arms, and ammunition section, and I don't really see any mention of his posting to the position of director of the facilities division. Almost like his position as director of the facilities division has been all but erased from the historical record. Remember in the last chapter we looked at the book, The American War Government, published in 1920 by Oxford University? It has its own oddity about it you might not have noticed when we first looked at it. Much like a lot of the official records of the war, such as Samuel Bush's war records at the National Archives, or complete sets of the war expenditures hearings. This book, too, is incomplete, and missing pages 1 through 53. So what's left literally starts on page 54, but it does mention Samuel Bush and the Facilities Division. On page 72, we see, when the conversion of resources proved inadequate, Samuel P. Bush put together the Facilities Division, in which, through the cooperation of all the agencies of government, plans were made for the actual creation of new facilities for war manufacture. And of course it was Bernard Baruch who put the facilities division together, naming Samuel Bush in charge of it as its director. And actually, I had found this fragment of a book a number of years ago and downloaded it, but I never understood the significance of Bush being in charge of the facilities division until the last year or so, which we'll eventually get to. And of the pages of this book that have survived for a century, pages 54 to 76, that's the only mention of Samuel P. Bush in them, leading me to wonder if there's any more written about him, perhaps in an introductory manner of sorts in the earlier portions of pages 1 through 53 that are missing. At any rate, we can see that Samuel P. Bush was very much a big part of this military-industrial merging being run by Bernard Baruch. So you'd think that somewhere in the thousands of pages of testimony of the war expenditures hearings, you'd find the testimony of Samuel P. Bush, right? But there's none to be found, at least not in any of the volumes I've managed to track down anyways. And perhaps this is part of the reason I can't find a complete set of these documents? Who knows? Remember in the last chapter we saw that Major General William Crozier testified at the hearings? And if you'll remember, he was Chief of the Ordnance until July 1918 but ceased to exercise the duties of Chief of Ordnance on December 20th, 1917. And remember what Samuel Bush was doing around that time, directing the Ordnance Facilities Expansion, a precursor to him becoming the Facilities Division Director. And in his testimony, General Crozer talks about the changes that were being made and didn't sound too happy overall about it, but he doesn't name Samuel Bush in any of his testimony. And also remember that in June of 1918, Samuel Bush was named Chief of Ordnance, Arms and Ammunition Section, Finished Products Division, War Industries Board. So I would figure they probably did interview Samuel Bush during the war expenditures hearings, but the volume that contains that testimony remains, for the time being, elusive or out of sight. But the name Samuel P. Bush is to be found in one of the volumes, however. Remember last chapter we saw that Bernard Baruch was on a list of people they wanted to give the Distinguished Service Medal to, but were denied? Well Samuel P. Bush was on that list as well, 
though he wouldn't have President Wilson make it an order that he get it a year later, like he did for Bernard Baruch. Remember, they were originally denied the award because they weren't actually part of the army, they were civilians. And notice they list Samuel Bush as being in charge of the facilities division, because that was his most important posting, something that time seems to have forgotten about over the course of a century. Bernard Baruch, in 1919, would write a final report of the Chairman of the War Industries Board to the President of the United States, though it wouldn't be released until 1935, as Senator Gerald P. Nye would release the whole thing, which is almost 1,200 pages, as one of the volumes of the munitions industry hearings. And it's not a step-by-step -step detailed listing of every department and who ran it. But he does mention Samuel Bush as Chief of the Forgings, Ordnance, Small Arms, and Small Arms Ammunition Section of the War Industries Board. Then we see Bernard Baruch releasing a book in 1921 titled, American Industry in the War, a Report of the War Industries Board. And just to quickly highlight what we looked at a couple of chapters ago, with what I term the Wall Street Kings in the lead up to the United States entering World War I, and the billions of reasons why. We can see here Bernard Baruch writes about the DuPont's military powder sales before and after the United States entered the war. The DuPont company had increased its facilities for the production of military powder from 500,000 pounds per month to nearly 30 million pounds per month. And from the munitions industry hearings in 1934, we see two of the DuPont brothers testifying with PRS DuPont saying how they took all the risk, and if the war had ended in early 1917, DuPont would have been in bad condition, and his brother Irene DuPont saying it would have been worse for the company if the war ended in 1916, as opposed to early 1917, which is the period in question from Chairman Gerald Nye. And remember, Russia was on the decline, with fighting even halting along the Eastern Front, and President Wilson was trying to play peacemaker and broker an end to the war. So it's a good thing for the DuPonts that not only did the war not end, but the U.S. would also enter the war as well. But we'll look deeper into the munitions industry hearings in part two of this series. Back to Bernard Baruch's 1921 book, in talking about American industry and the United States entry into the war, he says facilities and more were going to be needed without interference with the Allied program by the creation of new facilities, but in most instances by the conversion of existing facilities to new work. In other words, the very things that Samuel P. Bush would excel at first with the Ordnance Department for more than a year, and then as Director of the Facilities Division during the last few months of the war. And we see Samuel Bush's name mentioned a couple times in this book by Bernard Baruch, and notice what it says about Samuel Bush as the Facilities Director. By the fall of 1918, so many problems were arising in connection with the location and construction of new plants for war work, that a Facilities Division was formed for the purpose of harmonizing the activities. Samuel P. Bush was made the director of the division. And this lines up with what we saw about Samuel Bush in the 1920 Oxford book, The American War Government. At that point, namely the end of August 1918, there were problems with the entire overall American industrial war production effort. And Samuel Bush was named director of the new division created to fix it. And this would be because he did such a good job for the previous year plus directing the expansion of the ordnance facilities. And we'll be coming back to this, as in my opinion, these two postings have a much deeper impact on Samuel P. Bush's legacy than what appears upon a first glance. But now with the war over, there would be little time to celebrate, as there would be another battle looming ahead. The battle to reset society back to a normal peacetime setting. part of which would need to see prices and wages go back to normalized levels. And to try and achieve that, we see in early March of 1919, about three months after the end of the war, the Industrial Board of the Department of Commerce, as it was called, was created to try and negotiate with industry to control the prices of everything, and it would start with steel prices. And below, we can see that Samuel P. Bush was a member of this board. A few days later, we see the same news, and it was put together by the Council of National Defense, which was back running things as the War Industries Board under Bernard Baruch had disbanded in December. And there's the proper name of the board, and there's Samuel P. Bush as a member. 
And again, a few days later, we see the same news. And there's Samuel P. Bush. And here on March 20th, 1919, we see they're trying to get a handle on the prices of food and wages. And there's Samuel P. Bush. And then we see a couple months later on May 10th, 1919, the board quits. Following a final unsuccessful effort to bring the railroad administration and steel producers to an agreement on prices yesterday in New York, the resignation of Chairman George N. Peake of Moline, Illinois, and the other six members of the board were accepted by Secretary Redfield. Mr. Redfield paid high tribute to the board's work in a letter to Chairman Peake. You have not sought to control, but to cooperate, he said. You have exhausted the resources of courtesy. Your attitude has been unselfish, generous, and your vision broad. Individual letters were sent to each board member, including Samuel P. Bush. And then we see on May 27, 1919, the now disbanded Industrial Board of the Department of Commerce would release a statement, which in part read, Industry must stand the first shock of readjustment. Then the cost of living will have been so far reduced that the price of labor will be automatically reduced without any lowering of living standards. And again they mention the members of the board and their Samuel P. Bush. But that would be that, and the board wasn't able to accomplish anything. And as we saw earlier, by 1921, the prices of commodities were still high. And then, of course, you know what would happen eight years later, right? The stock market would crash, which would be followed by the Great Depression. Anyways, the year 1920 would be a sad year for Samuel Bush, as his first wife, Flora, would be killed. She was also the mother of Prescott Bush, George H.W. Bush's father. And here's an article about it if you want to pause and read it. But she was accidentally hit by a car while they were out for an early evening walk. Next we see in 1922, Samuel Bush and son were entered into a golf tournament. And that would be with Samuel's son James Bush, not Prescott Bush. In 1925, Samuel Bush would get married again to Martha Bell, and in 1926, we see Samuel and Martha Bush in the Society Pages attending the dinner. And then we can see in 1939, Samuel Bush is the president of the Citizen Tax League of Ohio. And of course, the next thing I could find, barely, was about Samuel Bush's death. So, as we've seen, Samuel P. Bush accomplished a great many things in his lifetime, and rose to some pretty high positions in the process. We saw that he was general manager and vice president of Buckeye Steel starting in 1901 which is where he would make his first connections with Frank Rockefeller in the world of the Wall Street Kings. And he sat on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And he was the first president of the National Manufacturers Association. He was the first president of the Ohio Tax League. He co-founded the Seattle Country Club and the Columbus Academy. He helped found the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And we saw some of his World War I involvement included leading the first war chest drive in Ohio in 1914. And he joined the General Munitions Board in 1915. He directed the expansion of the facilities of the Ordnance Department for over a year, between 1917 and 1918. He became the Division Chief of the Ordnance, Arms and Ammunition Section, Finished Products Division of the War Industries Board on June 1st of 1918. And on the same day, he became the division chief of the forging, small arms, and small arm ammunition section, finished products division of the War Industries Board. And those two divisions were obviously intertwined. Then he became director of the facilities division of the War Industries Board 
And we also saw that after the war, he was a member of the industrial board of the Department of Commerce. And in 1939, he was president of the Citizens Tax League of Ohio. So like I say, that's a pretty impressive list of accomplishments to be sure. And just to add more to that list, he was father to a longtime U.S. Senator, grandfather to a U.S. Vice President and then President, great-grandfather to another U.S. President who was also a Governor of Texas, and great-grandfather to another U.S. Presidential Candidate who was also a Governor of Florida. So why is it that it seems like Samuel P. Bush has been almost all but erased from history? As I mentioned before, trying to find documentation on Samuel Bush from the era that he thrived in, namely the early 1900s around World War I, has proven to be an extreme challenge. And then you see stuff like this, where the National Archives have allegedly destroyed his World War I records and correspondence to save space. And when you go to the National Archives, indeed, there is nothing there about Samuel Bush. Or how about all those newspapers we looked at where they all seem to be missing their editions of one day in particular, February 8th, 1948, the day Samuel Bush died. It's been documented that Samuel Bush and his eldest and most successful son, Prescott Bush, didn't get along. And we see Prescott turn down his share of the inheritance when Samuel Bush died. And there's this whole myth about how the Bushmen were all independent and made their own fortunes and whatnot. And that's a bunch of crap. From Prescott on down, they were raised wealthy and had the Bush name that Samuel firmly established within the ranks of the elites before and during World War I. Though Prescott would ultimately work for and align himself with his father-in-law, yet another Wall Street tycoon, George Herbert Walker which is also who Prescott would name his son after, George Herbert Walker Bush. And we'll look more into that in part two of this series, but how about George Herbert Walker Bush? As I mentioned earlier, he was in college when his grandfather, Samuel Bush, died. And that was the same year George H.W. Bush would graduate from Yale and was in the secret society, Skull and Bones. So surely he knew his grandfather but I've never once seen him make a reference to his grandfather, Samuel Bush, in any way, shape, or form. And if you go to the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library, you'll not find a thing about Samuel Bush, nor will you find a mention of Samuel Bush at the George W. Bush Presidential Library. And I have to say that with the list of accomplishments to Samuel Bush's name, I find it rather odd that neither of the Bush presidents have ever brought him up. Remember, as we saw earlier, Samuel P. Bush was mentioned for the Distinguished Service Medal for his World War I work, and the only reason he didn't get it was because he was a civilian. So, as the Commander-in-Chief of the nation, you wouldn't tout your grandfather or great-grandfather in W. Bush's case in some manner, in some way? Back in 1919, they wanted to give him a war medal. And notice in that memorandum that they list Samuel P. Bush in charge of the Facilities Division, which is something to remember as we go forward. But yet now, it's like Samuel Bush almost didn't exist. And when looking at this rather impressive list of accomplishments by Samuel Bush, there's nothing illegal about anything. So like I say, I find it rather odd that Samuel Bush seems to have been all but forgotten about, even by his own family. For a while I thought, could it be because he was part of the birth of the military industrial complex? I mean that might not go over too well if you're going to be running for president in 1980, and George H.W. Bush did. But only Samuel Bush documents were destroyed? We've seen loads of stuff on Bernard Baruch, the DuPonts, the Morgans, the Rockefellers, and so on. And though Samuel Bush held some pretty lofty company and positions, he was certainly not as powerful as the Wall Street Kings, right? So I've always wondered why Samuel Bush's records and documentation relating to him have been destroyed or hidden away or just not there to be found, except for the odd little tidbits I found over the years and collected. And then, a number of months ago, I realized the answer to that question, and it was staring me in the face the whole time, really. I just hadn't put two and two together, so to speak. And I have to say, the answer I discovered just blew me away, and then everything started to make sense. And I certainly do not believe Samuel Bush's war records were destroyed at the National Archives to quote, save space, end quote. 
The real secret behind it all lies in these two positions he held during the war. And the big problem there, again, especially if you're running for president of the United States, can be summed up in two nasty words. Now I'm not saying that Samuel Bush was responsible for the United States' first chemical weapons industry, but he certainly appears to have played a big role in its creation. Having a look at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, a government agency, they write, by July 1918, research and development on agents such as lewisite passed from civilian to military control, as the entire chemical weapons program moved from the Bureau of Mines to the Army's newly organized chemical warfare service. And that's not entirely quite accurate, as we'll see in a minute. But the War Industries Board, led by Bernard Baruch, did, in fact, take over the various chemical weapons programs, much like they took over Hollywood, as we saw earlier. And the NCBI correctly points out that there were almost 2,000 scientists and technicians working on chemical warfare research, making the program the biggest in the world at the time. Now let's have a look again in the Handbook of Economic Agencies of the War of 1917, published by the War Department in September of 1919. And we can see the Chemical Warfare Service was created on June 25th, 1918. And remember the NCBI said the entire chemical weapons program moved from the Bureau of Mines to the Army's newly organized Chemical Warfare Service? But it wasn't just the Bureau of Mines and civilian research into chemical weapons that was already going on. We can see that the newly formed Chemical Warfare Service was made up of the Chemical Service section of the National Army the gas defense production of the medical department, the gas offense production of the ordnance department, and the research that had been developed by the Bureau of Mines, which the NCBI is talking about. But it's the gas offensive production of the ordnance department that is of interest here, because the gas offensive production of the ordnance department was being developed and expanded at the same time. We see that Samuel Bush was directing the ordnance facilities expansion for more than a year up until August 1918, which means Samuel Bush was directing that expansion since early 1917. And notice down below it says Edgewood Arsenal, which was used for gas offense, was ordered on February 3rd, 1919, to be returned to the Ordnance Department and became a part of the Aberdeen Proving Ground. And the Edgewood Arsenal and the Aberdeen Proving Ground are pretty much in the same place, but keep them in mind as we'll become about to them shortly. We also see the creation of the Development Division of the Chemical Warfare Service on June 28, 1918, and it developed material from the Research Division to the point where it could be turned over to the Lakehurst Proving Ground, which is another place we're going to have a look at coming up. And remember, for more than a year leading up to August 1918, Samuel Bush was directing the expansion of the Ordnance Facilities. And during this time, we saw that Major General William Crozier was the longtime chief of the Ordnance Department until July of 1918, officially. But he ceased to exercise the duties as Chief of Ordnance in December of 1917, six months earlier. And remember, as we saw earlier with Bernard Baruch, making things official sometimes is an afterthought to the actions already taken place. And the Ordnance Department was going through some major changes, reorganization, and expansion during this time with the expansion at least being led by Samuel Bush. And once the bulk of the changes were done, we'll see on June 1st, 1918, that Samuel Bush would be named Chief of the Ordnance and its related sections under the Finished Products Division of the War Industries Board. So I can't help but wonder if Samuel Bush became sort of the unofficial acting Chief of Ordnance after Major General William Crozier ceased to exercise the duties of Chief in December of 1917, and I guess we'll never know. And I say acting chief, as Samuel Bush, being a civilian, would not be allowed to be the chief of the Ordnance Department as it was structured in 1917 and early 1918, not until the War Industries Board in 1918 under Bernard Baruch with presidential authority would take it over and restructure it all for a time, and then name Samuel Bush as chief 
and then it would all revert back into the Ordnance Department after the war was over, when the War Industries Board folded up. At any rate, we also saw that on August 26, 1918, Samuel Bush was made director of the Facilities Division, and its function was to oversee all the construction and conversion of the war facilities of all government agencies, except shipbuilding. So this would include all the construction going on with the Chemical Warfare Service as well. Non-war facilities were handled in the Priorities Division. So there's about as close of a snapshot of Samuel P. Bush's wartime service, as you're likely to find. Now let's have a look at some of what was going on during that time period. And we see on October 25, 1917, the government's taken over the land that would become the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. And then a month later, on November 20, 1917, the name becomes official. The Aberdeen Proving Ground is the name adopted by the War Department for the new Ordnance Testing Station. And again, remember what Samuel Bush was doing during this time period, directing the expansion of the Ordnance Facilities. And below we see, construction work is now in progress at the new Proving Ground, where tests are to be made with heavy projectiles, or in other words, Ordnance. And here's an interesting document from the time period, a report of the Chemical War Service, published in 1918. And don't forget, the Chemical War Service wasn't created until June 25, 1918. And inside we find the Gas Offense Production Division. This is in charge of Colonel W.H. Walker. The main plant of this division is the Edgewood Arsenal. The plans of a large part of this plant were originally designed under the supervision of Lieutenant Colonel E.J.W. Ragsdale of the Ordnance Department, who, with Lieutenant Colonel E.M. Jans, started the construction. In addition to this arsenal, plants at other places are producing toxic gases and substances used for offensive purposes. And below that we see the Proving Division. The proving ground for testing the gas shells is located at Lakehurst. Experiments of various types have been carried out at the American University, Edgewood Arsenal, and Aberdeen, but are now largely concentrated at Lakehurst. Here, gas shells of various caliber and other gas warfare materials are tried out. These tests are accompanied by chemical and psychological experiments. We see on September 24, 1918, so Samuel Bush is now underway in his promotion as director of the facilities division and in charge of all construction across the country for all the government agencies except shipbuilding and civilian projects. And here we see the training camp for the chemical warfare section, now under construction at Lakehurst, will be named Camp Kendrick. Here we see on October 30th, 1918, a simply amazing letter to the editor. And this letter is from Lee Koonsman, and Lee is his middle name, his first name is George, and he's also a Freemason as well. And he's part of the 3rd Chemical Battalion, working at the Edgewood Arsenal, and he sent his letter in on October 20th, 1918. And he writes, As very little is known of the work of our great arsenals, a brief outline might be of interest to the Brothers of Lamar Lodge. And the Brothers of Lamar Lodge he's referring to are Freemasons. And notice he says very little is known of the work of the arsenals. So I'm really glad he decided to write this letter. And I'm also glad it was published and survives to this day so we can read it. And Lee Koonsman goes on to write. The Edgewood Arsenal is the general headquarters for the entire Chemical Warfare Service. And when all of the plants now under construction are completed, it will be the largest chemical plant in the world. And notice the date. Samuel Bush is in charge of the facilities division already. So he would be the top dog in charge of, quote, all of the plants now under construction, end quote, at the Edgewood Arsenal. And check out what Lee Koonsman writes next. The work of the arsenal is divided into two general divisions. First, the production of poison gases, and second, the loading of shells with these gases. Imagine writing that in a letter to the editor today. He goes on to write, 
We are concentrating on the manufacture of three gases, mustard oil, phosgene, and tear gas. The first two are violently poisonous, and the mustard has the additional property of producing the most painful burns whenever it comes in contact with the skin. And he goes on to give some more descriptions of the effects of the gases. And we'll come back to Lee Koonsman and the rest of his letter in a bit, but let's have a look into this, the Aberdeen Proving Ground, Edgewood Arsenal put out by the National Park Service under the Department of the Interior in 1985. And they tell us, one special area that came under the jurisdiction of the Ordnance Department in World War I was chemical warfare. And looking back to June 21, 1918, we see the Secretary of War, Newton Baker, and officers of the Ordnance Department were on an inspection trip at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, which is next door to the Edgewood Arsenal, and both were under the jurisdiction of the Ordnance Department. At the Edgewood Arsenal, they would develop and create the poison bombs, and next door at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, they would test the different shells. And a lot would go on to be tested at the Lakehurst Proving Grounds in New Jersey as well. And notice what happened when Secretary Baker and the Ordnance officers were on their inspection tour. A bomb accidentally went off, killing two soldiers and wounding a third. Anyways, back to the Department of the Interior document, we see down here. Construction began on the first shell filling plant on November 1st, 1917, on the part of the Proving Grounds then known as Gunpowder Neck Reservation. And Gunpowder Neck Reservation was part of the land that we saw the government take over in October of 1917 to create the Aberdeen Proving Grounds and it wouldn't officially be called Edgewood Arsenal until May 4, 1918. But when the construction began on November 1, 1917, again, remember what the government's own record of activities documents about what Samuel Bush was doing during this time period. He was directing the Ordnance Facility's expansion, and the Aberdeen Proving Grounds and the Edgewood Arsenal were major expansion projects under the Ordnance Department at that time. And let's have a look at this. Published in March of 1919 by the enlisted men of the Edgewood Arsenal. And here's the insight of the filling plant one year later in November of 1918. And it says they're filling 75 millimeter shells with mustard gas. And if we go to the current Aberdeen Proving Grounds website, we see they have the picture there, and it was taken, ironically enough, on November 11, 1918, the day the war ended. And although the war was over, the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Edgewood Arsenal, and Lakehurst Proving Grounds were just getting started. Here's one of the eight cell rooms of the chlorine plant. And here's a look at the then latest mustard gas unit. And here's some pills for the Huns. And below they tell us, the picture shows a number of these cylinders filled with phosgene and ready for shipment in bulk to our allies. And to know, reportedly, US forces in World War I never ended up using chemical weapons on the battlefield but they did supply the French and the British with plenty of them. And looking back to that report from the Department of the Interior, as we saw Lee Koonsman write, as very little is known of the great work of our arsenals, they write, after November 1918, the Chemical Warfare Service in Edgewood Arsenal faced a sharp role change. What had seemed a natural and necessary response in wartime seemed inhumane and unconscionable in peacetime. Statistics that the Chemical Warfare Service had been proud to publish right after the war became monstrous to a public reeling under the horrors of war. Instead of receiving accolades for a job well done, the Chemical Warfare Service found itself desperately trying to justify its existence and its record both in terms of the morality of the chemical warfare and its firm belief that chemicals would be a vital part of any war fought in the future. 
Now let's have a look at some of the legacy these places have given us. And here we see World War I era chemical shells discovered on Joint Base. And the Joint Base is what the Lakehurst Proving Grounds evolved into. And this is from February 1st, 2016. We see two World War I era artillery runs containing chemical agents were discovered in November and December on a remote area of the Joint Base. A 75mm shell that tested positive for mustard gas was recovered on November 23rd, and a Liven's projectile canister containing phosgene gas was found December 2nd. And here's a report on Lakehurst issued December 21st, 2016 by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. And they say in their report, Beginning in World War I, large areas at the base were used for munitions and chemical weapon storage, disposal, testing, or training. Since that time, Lakehurst was used for storage, training, or testing of munitions by military and civilian organizations. The boundaries of some of these historical use or disposal areas are uncertain or unknown. Additional munitions have been found on base. Newly found records identify three locations where munitions have been or might be found off base to the north, south, and west. They write who might be affected and then list a whole host of people. How might persons be harmed? And they give us a list of different ways. So that's the Lakehurst Proving Grounds, a hundred years later. And now let's go have a look at the Aberdeen Proving Ground and the Edgewood Arsenal. And from the Environmental Protection Agency, we see, from 1917 to the present, site activities have included conducting chemical research programs, manufacturing chemical agents, and testing, storage, and disposal of toxic materials. And what is the current site status? There are currently 54 operable units to address about 100 contaminated areas at the site. Over 30 decision documents have been completed. At least 20 more will need to be issued to complete all site cleanups. And from the New Yorker in 2012. For two decades during the Cold War, the United States Army tested chemical weapons on American soldiers at Edgewood Arsenal. They were exposed to chemicals ranging from mustard gas and sarin to LSD and PCP. And for the last hundred plus years, countries around the world have been experimenting with various chemicals and viruses. And here's some food for thought. As of this production, we're approaching four million deaths now resulting from our current coronavirus pandemic of COVID-19. We were told it wasn't spreading. We were told there was no reason to wear a mask. Then we were told it probably came from a wet market. And no, it didn't come from the Wuhan Institute of Virology that just coincidentally happened to be experimenting with bat coronaviruses in the couple of years leading up to the pandemic. That's just a conspiracy theory. But then, about a year and a half after the pandemic started, suddenly the lab leak theory is being taken seriously. You think? They were working with bat coronaviruses at the Wuhan Institute of Virology since 2017. And according to Dr. Richard Ebright, a molecular biologist at Rutgers University, the SARS virus from the 2002 pandemic had escaped from facilities in Beijing previously, multiple times. And this COVID-19 outbreak began in Wuhan. What a coincidence, huh? And then we find out that the National Institute of Health through one of Dr. Fauci's groups was funding the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but of course not for gain-of-function research, except that's the type of research they were doing at the Wuhan Institute of Technology. And then we find out that the Wuhan lab apparently deleted files showing that Dr. Fauci authorized funding. Go figure. Now, Let's have a look at something I find simply amazing. The 1918 pandemic killed over 50 million people. 
And remember, we're approaching nearly 4 million deaths in our current coronavirus pandemic by comparison. So have a look at this headline from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The deadliest flu. The complete story of the discovery and reconstruction of the 1918 pandemic virus. Imagine that. Reconstruction of the 1918 virus that killed over 50 million people. And some think this is a good idea. In the 1990s, they exhumed the body of a woman in Alaska who had died more than 75 years earlier, and her body's fat stores in the permafrost kept the virus intact and preserved in her lungs all that time, allowing researchers to discover and start messing with it. Then, in 2005, after years of researching and experimenting, they were more than happy to announce that they had completely resequenced the 1918 virus in its entirety. And look who's there happily making the announcement. Dr. Anthony Fauci. And Time Magazine tells us they spent nearly a decade mapping the genome of the 1918 flu strain. So, in the 1990s, they discovered an intact sample of the 1918 flu virus, a virus so deadly that it killed over 50 million people. So, of course, they decided to start trying to recreate it. And then we see we got SARS in 2002, swine flu in 2009, MERS in 2012, and COVID appeared in late 2019. And just to throw it out there, perhaps if laboratories around the world weren't doing this kind of research, we might not have these kind of problems. Interestingly, the CDC tells us the 1918 virus hit military personnel first. And let's go back to that 1918 letter to the editor from Lee Koonsman that we looked at. And here it is in its entirety. And while I was looking in the 1919 book on the Edgewood Arsenal, they list the roster of the Arsenal as of November 1918. And now in Company H, we see George Lee Koonsman. Anyways, in part of his letter, he writes, We are quartered very comfortably, and the mess is fine. Have escaped the flu so far. And look at how he puts the word flu in quotes, almost as if he's mocking it, like it's not really a flu, but rather something else. And when you think about it, it's quite the coincidence that the worst global pandemic to sweep the planet in over 500 years since the plague or Black Death of the late Middle Ages happened at the same time that various countries were developing horrific chemical warfare capabilities to be used in the war. That's quite the coincidence, huh? Viruses in people and animals are natural, of course, but a lab trying to engineer or mutate a virus from an animal to be contagious to a human can lead to disastrous consequences. So I wonder if it's possible that something similar happened during World War I, and one of the countries was experimenting in such manner with the H1N1 virus, which led to the 1918 pandemic. It's unknown exactly how it started. There's theories and ideas, sure, but nothing to be absolutely certain of. We do know it was rediscovered in the 1990s, and we've been having pandemics ever since. Anyways, that's all, like I say, some food for thought. And back to Samuel Bush. While he, of course, didn't create the United States' first chemical warfare industry, he certainly appears to have played a large role in its construction. And perhaps this is why his records were destroyed at the National Archives, maybe? But by who? And personally, I believe his grandson, George H.W. Bush, might be the one behind that move. Just guessing, and you'll see a little bit more about why I think this in part three of this series. But here's an example of George H.W. Bush's thoughts on keeping certain documents or records available. And this is found in the final report of the Independent Council for Iran-Contra Matters by Lawrence E. Walsh. When then Vice President George H.W. Bush found out that Secretary of State George Shultz had kept notes on his meetings with the President, and these would be Iran-Contra related notes, Bush responded as follows in his personal diary. Howard Baker in the presence of the President told me today that George Shultz had kept 700 pages of personal notes dictated to his staff notes on personal meetings he had with the President. 
I found this almost inconceivable. Not only that he kept the notes, but that he had turned them over to Congress. I would never do it. I would never surrender such documents, and I wouldn't keep such detailed notes. And of course, don't forget that George H.W. Bush was the director of the CIA only a few years previous. And we'll look into all that in part three of the series. But this is part of why I believe it was George H.W. Bush who had pretty much most of anything about his grandfather, Samuel P. Bush, removed from the public record. Having material that your grandfather played a big role in the construction of the facilities that were created for the Chemical Warfare Service of World War I wouldn't look too good in the public eye if you're running for the highest office. At any rate, one thing's for certain. Samuel P. Bush was the first Bush to climb into the ranks of the elites of Wall Street, opening up the world stage for the generations of Bushes that would follow. And something to keep in mind, I'm not saying that Samuel P. Bush has done anything criminal, of course. He earned his way up the ranks, and by all accounts I can see, he was a straight-up, hard-working, highly intelligent, honest, and very patriotic man. He was placed in certain positions in the war, and apparently he did a good enough job that some wanted to give him the Distinguished Service Medal. And perhaps that may even have been justified. I certainly don't condemn the man by any means at all. But the one thing I do blame him for is that he gave us a hundred years of these guys. And that's probably worse than any chemical warfare factory he may have been responsible for the construction of. 